You probably have heard a lot about the recent vaccination mandate issued by the Biden administration through OSHA. You know, that's the agency that says you need to wear a hard hat on construction sites. Well, guess what? You probably also know that the Biden administration using OSHA tried to force all private employers with 100 or more employees to get their employees vaccinated as well by mandatory vaccinations. Well, guess what happened this week? The Supreme Court has spoken on this, whether the Biden administration has that authority. And the result turns out to be a massive victory for the rule of law. You see, the Supreme Court has stayed or halted, stopped, if you will, the implementation of this vaccination mandate. And its reasoning, the legal reasoning means that on the merits, uh, the OSHA mandate has to be struck down as a matter of law. Now, when we get back, I'm gonna go into the details of this case and why why you, as a gun owner and an advocate of the Second Amendment, should applaud this decision as a decision in favor of the rule of law and the Constitution. Hey folks, I'm Mark and welcome to the Four Boxes Diner. Gun owners should always be wary of federal government getting into their business in all respects. In fact, all Americans in all parts of our lives should be really against this. You see, the government is often not doing things in your best interest, but they're often doing things in their best interest or in the best interest of some special interest. Now, this is particularly true when you deal with deep state agencies or with administrative agencies. That's that alphabet soup, you know, EPA, FDA, OSHA, on and on and on. Now, you got to watch very carefully what they do, because oftentimes they will implement sweeping rules and regulations that our elected representatives really don't get involved involved with, they don't have a say in, and uh, they don't talk about or basically sign off on through legislation or otherwise, you see? Now here's why I think it's important for gun owners to care about this OSHA ruling dealing with vaccination mandates. Regardless of where you come down on the vaccination issue or the, or the COVID issue, that's not what we're talking about here today. We're talking about the rule of law and the Supreme Court decision and what it means as a matter of constitutional interpretation and rule of law. Well, first of all, I think this is a huge attitude shift against the Biden administration uh, and its emergency powers by the US Supreme Court. You see, this decision shows that the administration, the presidency, any presidency for that matter, not just the Biden administration, they simply cannot do whatever they want uh, using agencies through executive action and regulations, right? They're simply not allowed to use these agencies as a substitute for pushing legislation that has to go through the Congress. Second, I think also the Supreme Court decision against the vaccination mandates uh, shows exactly what could happen but for the Supreme Court stepping in if, let's say, another agency like the alcohol, alcohol, tobacco and firearms, that's ATF, for example, got too far off the line or out of line. You see, your Second Amendment rights are always under fire, as I see it, whenever certain anti-gunners get into the White House and become in charge. And that's because they love to write rules just like the vaccination mandate rules, but they would like to do the same thing, of course, in favor of gun control. Now, these are rules that are overly broad beyond the agency's orders from Congress. And most importantly, you see, it's a way to kind of what I like to call defraud, if you will, the legislative system, get around, circumvent, sidestep, work around the way laws are supposed to be enacted in the United States, which is that Congress passes laws and then the president signs them. And if the president doesn't sign them, then Congress has the ability to override them and vote it in the law, overriding a veto. But you see, right now, in the context of the vaccination mandate, we have to keep in mind that all of this, to me, is directly analogous to the ATF and what it could do with gun control, and also all the other agency actions that could potentially uh, be used against your Second Amendment rights, perhaps, like the CDC could implement certain public health ordinances or rules that touch on the Second Amendment. I guess in theory they could do that because they could say it's an emergency or public health uh, urgency that requires them to do it. Here's a brief history of how administrative agencies work, okay? I wanna step back for a second and just remind you how the federal government is supposed to work. To begin with, there's three branches of government. Going back to high school, right? You have the executive branch, which is the president, you have the legislative branch, which is Congress, made up of two houses. That's the House of Representatives, elected every two years. 
and the U.S. Senate, consisting of senators that are elected, you know, every six years. And then, of course, you have the third branch of government, that's the courts, would led off, of course, by the U.S. Supreme Court, but then lower federal courts as well. So again, three branches of government, the presidency, that's the Congress, and then the court system. So what exactly are these administrative agencies? Well, these administrative agencies are, are extraordinarily powerful. They're full of unelected bureaucrats that really have lifetime jobs in a sense because they can never really be fired. Um, even though their leaders may change between presidential administrations, the reality is the bulk of the bureaucracy are civil servants who are not going anywhere no matter who the president is, okay? Now, I want, to under, I want you to understand this other thing about administrative agencies. You see, to me, one of the first things that you can anticipate with most politicians in Washington, D.C., is they want to pass on the responsibility or the buck. Okay, you see, as a general matter, they don't like to be held responsible for the encroachments on civil freedoms by the federal government. It makes them look bad. They don't want to go on record voting for something that's extremely unpopular. Now, this is where the administrative agencies, or and some people refer to them as the deep state, come into play. You see, the, the professional politicians in Washington, D.C. Uh, use administrative agencies in a way to let them pass the buck so they can't be blamed for bad things that occur or policies that are unpopular. Now, while you and I might be up in arms about you know, mandates or needless regulations or rules that impose costs on businesses or on law uh, or, or on, uh, you know, gun companies or what have you. The reality is lawmakers are able to shrug their shoulders off and say, hey, I'm just in Congress. There's nothing I can do about it. It's in the ATF's hands. It's in OSHA's hands. It's in the FDA's hands. It's in the CDC's hands. It's in the public health administrative you know, agency's hands. There's nothing I can really do about it. Go talk to them. Okay, but the truth is, this is not really accurate because the politicians in Washington, as I see it, this is my view, um, is they know exactly what they're doing. Um, because negligence by, let's say, the Democrats in passing legislation through Congress cannot be papered over, over through filing rules through bureaucrats at OSHA. And that's what the Supreme Court ruled this week. Now let's get into the nuts and bolts of the Supreme Court's ruling in these vaccination mandate cases. Legally, the Biden administration failed on statutory grounds. Here's a quote from the per curiam or the unsigned opinion of the Supreme Court. What the court wrote was this, administrative agencies are creatures of statute. They accordingly possess only the authority that Congress has provided. Okay, now what that means is that an administrative agency like the EPA or the OSHA or the FDA, whatever, they can only act pursuant and consistent with authority that was granted to them in statute by Congress, because the agencies only exist because someone passed a law years ago through the Congress and through the White House that created that agency. And when they created the agency, they gave those agencies powers, authority, if you will. So let's look at this authority. What can OSHA do? Well, they can't regulate everyone all over the world outside of the workplace, right? They're about workplace rules. They can't pass such broad rules as I see it and they never have. Now, in fact, what's very interesting is that the last six times that an OSHA rule has made it to the courts, all but one of them has been struck down for overreach of power. Isn't that an interesting trend? And not one of those was anywhere near the scope um, of the vaccination mandate. Okay, in terms of the size of it and how many people recovered and how important it was. Okay, now that what's very interesting is that the U.S. Supreme Court, when it analyzed this, this is what it actually said. Permitting OSHA to regulate the hazards of daily life simply because most Americans have jobs and face those same risks while on the clock would significantly expand OSHA's regulatory authority without clear congressional authorization. That's what the Supreme Court said. They just don't have the power. Okay, so yeah, um, they're going to strike down an emergency rule that does exactly that. That's what this court did. And it gets even better from my point of view, because the Supreme Court went on to point out how little congressional support there was for this vaccination mandate. What has Congress said about a vaccination mandate, you might even ask? Well, it turns out that the Supreme Court actually summed this up in their opinion. They thought this was relevant, so that's why they put in their opinion. The court wrote, quote, in fact, the most noteworthy action concerning the vaccine mandate by either House of Congress has been a majority vote of the Senate 
disapproving the regulation on December 8th, 2021. Now, I don't know about you, but that doesn't sound like a rule of the people at all. It sounds like a federal agency far outstripping its allowance, all in the name of helping out the president, the administration it supposedly serves. And not once in their short 50 year history has OSHA ever addressed an airborne virus, nor have they ever had the gall to put in a rule that only affects businesses with only 100 people. Perhaps implying that if you have 99 people, the grave danger stops the spread of COVID-19 and it's no longer president because you only have 99 people. If you had 100, oh my God, watch out. But if it's 99, you're perfectly fine. Now other agencies, of course, are far worse. You see, administrative agencies uh, they all started back in FDRs at President Franklin Delano Roosevelt's term in the 1930s. Now, he put in nearly 70 administrative unelected bureaucratic agencies in his time in office. Specifically, it was 69. That's how many he created. They called them alphabet soup agencies, the NLRA, the NLRB, the FCC, the FDIC, the FCA, the, C -E uh, the SEC, and on and on and on. So goes the list. Now these agencies are a headache for anyone in business. We know this. And taking federal money ties you to them. And that's why a lot of conservative institutions do not take federal dollars because it makes them answerable to the federal government. And who has the power of the rule of law on the federal level? Again, you would think historically Congress, but that's not necessarily true at all. Don't forget about these random unelected bureaucrats at all these agencies. You see, when they come knocking at your door, you have to answer. And no, you don't get to elect them. You don't get to fire them. They're appointed and there many of them are civil servants there for basically life because they can't be fired for all intents and purposes. So I want to mention briefly the second opinion released by the Supreme Court on the vaccination mandate case. Again, there was two of them, one involving OSHA dealing with employers with employees of more than 100 employees. And then the other one dealt with uh, Health and Department of Health and Human Services and Medicare and Medicaid. OK, I want to talk about that for just a second. Now, the second opinion released by the Supreme Court denied the stay against the Health and Human Services Agency. You see, it kept that vaccination mandate in place because those workers received federal federal dollars. They are subject to federal regulation because they are receiving money from the federal government. But OSHA, since it's trying to affect a mandate for private employers, not under the rule of thumb of the federal government, was ruled against. So again, this is very important to understand. It's important because the Supreme Court is not ruling on the usefulness of the vaccination one way or the other. They're not making any medical determinations, nor should they. It's not their job. Okay, that's not what the Supreme Court's interested in. You see, they're not interested in arguing about whether or not you can go to a holiday party or not. Do you have to wear a mask? Is there enough air circulating in the room? Whatever. They're, what they're really looking at is what does the law say about the power of this federal agency, OSHA, or in the case of the uh, Medicare, Ma Man Medicare case, uh, the Health and Human Services. And again, here the law says that the government can regulate federally funded healthcare systems. So the HHS mandate, that's the Health and Human Services mandate dealing with Medicare and Medicaid paid facilities, passes the you know, mandate muster, that the mandate passes the muster, okay? But OSHA not so much. And that reminds us that the Supreme Court is acting on the side of the law and no one else. And that's exactly what gun owners should be happy about because any decision that reads the Second Amendment to consider its text, its history and tradition is gonna be frankly very beneficial to American gun owners. No one ever passed a law allowing OSHA to regulate your life outside the workplace. And even within the workplace, you needed to be in grave danger in order for them to announce a so-called temporary or an emergency temporary standard, which is what they did with this vaccine mandate. So no one voted for this. Congress didn't vote on this. The president voted on this. Well, we, do, you know, we and many people in America don't agree on this vaccination mandate question, right? It's a, it's a ma matter of public debate uh, real, to be decided by our elected officials, presumably. Uh, it was never passed by law by Congress. Congress didn't pass it. The president never signed a bill. So it wasn't mentioned in the American Rescue Plan. That's the bailout program or the, uh, the the stimulus package, whatever you want to call it. Uh, the only congressional piece of legislation dealing with COVID-19, it didn't, it didn't address this issue. So there's really no backing from the legislature on this matter. Now the Supreme Court spelled this out very clearly in its opinion when it said, quote, it is not our role to waste such trade-offs. In our system of government, that is the responsibility of those chosen by the people through democratic processes. So as I see it to end, this is a huge win. Now keep in mind that OSHA wasn't just asking for a vaccine mandate. In effect, they were 
asking for almost unlimited discretion and authority to mandate new nationwide rules in response to the pandemic, so long as those rules were reasonably related to workplace safety. Now, this all comes out, by the way, if you want to be geeky about this, it comes out of a statute 29 USC section 655 C1, which is the law that was passed in 1970, not 1791, 1970, allowing emergency temporary standards to exist. But again, that's not how our country is supposed to work in terms of passing laws that we're supposed to comply with. You can't just tell everyone that they have to wear shoes to bed because they might stub their toe. You cannot manage or micromanage Americans' lives at this level. And you certainly cannot do it without Congress's blessing, which is what OSHA was trying to do, and the Supreme Court slapped them down. So how does this really affect you as a gun owner in America? Well, first of all, you can rest easily uh, knowing that OSHA is not going to knock on your door and demand a $136,532 uh, fine for a vaccination mandate violation anytime soon. That does not appear to be going on. And yes, by the way, I believe that was the actual amount they were looking to fine people uh, per violation. Uh, but more importantly, I think you can have faith that our Supreme Court is likely going to uphold the law uh, and the rule of law going forward. Now, that that means that they're on the lookout for this kind of administrative overreach. And if lawsuits make it all the way to them, they will serve hopefully as a backstop to federal encroachment on all of our rights, including, of course, our Second Amendment right to keep and bear arms. Now, we think a lot about this as gun owners. I know I do. This is incredibly important for the Second Amendment. So it's good to hear that we have the Supreme Court, as best we can tell from the evidence, on our side of the law, uh, no matter what regulation or what regulatory agency we're talking about. You see, it proves the importance of having an independent judicial system that believes in the representative that you vote into power is supposed to write that law and not allow laws to be created by some unelected bureaucrat that we don't even know who, they're, who they are or their names or anything about them, okay? Well, I hope you learned something today. Thanks for turning in to the Four Boxes Diner where we serve hot, fresh Second Amendment news and analysis. And if you like what you heard, please spread the word and we'll see you soon here at the Four Boxes Diner. Orders up, table 2A.